program that the Blaffer Museum will be presenting with the Holocaust Museum in Houston. And that's gonna be taking place January 15th and February 19th, where Simon will be in conversation with the filmmaker, Alexandra Zapruder, as well as the curator of education at the Holocaust Museum, Mary Lee Wiebeck. So we will be sending more information um, in the coming weeks, but just wanted to let all of you know and kind of circle that in your calendars. So I'm now going to give a very brief introduction to Simon, and it's been such a pleasure and such an illuminating journey to work with him on Hope House, which it opened at the Blaffer Museum on October 31st and will be running through March 14th. So we very much encourage you to come and visit in person. We are open Wednesdays to Sundays, noon to five, and it's always free. Um, but today we're going to be, Simon is going to be placing Hope House and his work studying Anne Frank into the context of his larger practice. So just some very brief biographical notes. Simon was born in the UK in 1982 and spent his child, childhood moving between Japan, Europe and Africa. He received a BA in architecture from Cambridge University in 2005 and an MFA from the Stadel School in Frankfurt in 2008. Simon has had many solo but just a handful um, of the shows are Lafayette Anticipations in Paris to 2018, Kunsthaus Bregenz in Austria in 2018 as well, the Photographer's Gallery in London in 2016, the Carpenter Center for the Visual Arts at Harvard in 2014, and the Power Plant in Toronto in 2011. Uh, his work has also been featured in a number of group exhibitions, just most recently, Manual Override at The Shed in New York in 2019, and Is This Tomorrow at Whitechapel, also in 2019. And I wanted to highlight especially, um, Simon has been prodigious in his um, um, visibility in biennials around the world. And to just name a few, he has been, his work has been presented at the Venice Biennale, Sao Paulo, Guangzhou, Shanghai, Hi, Sharjah, Berlin, as well as most recently the Istanbul Biennial in 2019. Simon has received numerous honors, um, including the Rome Scholarship, as well as the Cartier Award. And we are, again, so very pleased to be presenting his work. So I am now going to hand it off to Simon. Thank you so much, Stephen. Um, I don't know if anyone has had a chance to see the exhibition in person, except for, of course, people working at the museum. Um, I haven't seen it in person, but it, it, from the images I see, it's at so beautifully installed. So I think from now on, I'm just not going to install my own shows. <laughs> <laughs> um, or at least there's things hiding from the camera that I can't see. Um, I'm going to um, talk about, um, I'm going to talk through several works and see how much time we, we have that might give a bit more context to the Hope House exhibition. I'm also going to talk a little bit about the origins of the Hope House um, work and how I came to um, working with the subject of Anne Frank. And um, it's, going, it's not going to be a super structured talk, it's going to be more giving you some kind of tapas of different, um, different works over the years. So I'm going to be changing to a slideshow. Um, which I hope you will be able to see. So, can you see this? Looks good, yep. Yeah. yeah, okay. So this is um, one of the first works I ever made um, when I was actually still in art school. It's called Welcome to the Hotel Mumba. And um, it really set the seeds for all of my practice really afterwards. It's based on um, the real life story of my parents who lived in Spain in the 1970s under the Franco dictatorship. Um, my brother was born in Spain. I never um, experienced the bar and hotel that my parents owned and ran. Um, but my father being Japanese and my mum being British, they just randomly chose to live in Spain under a fascist dictatorship, which they claim they didn't really know about. Um, and run this bar. And there are lots of um, incredible stories that I grew up with um, that sort of set this as a very romantic period in, in my family history. And um, when I was at art school, I um, found it very difficult to produce in, in a studio um, with a lot of people around. And um, I have this um, 
I sort of developed this kind of secret project where I started to use these incredible stories from this history of a fascist dictatorship that my parents would tell me about, about the Franco soldiers coming into the bar and laying their machine guns down and them having to bribe the soldiers. And there was one particular story, which is from the day that um, General Franco died, um, where all of the customers who were Catalan, who were not allowed to speak their own language um, in the region that my parents lived, um, suddenly flooded the bar with pornography and there was just porn over all of the tables. Um, and they'd been secretly trading this illegal material um, um, without my parents' knowledge at this bar. And when Franco had died, they said, we can now do this publicly because pornography was, was illegal at the time. And as an avid porn aficionado myself, I decided to get involved in um, writing my own erotic stories. And I started to think that, um, I started to look for gay histories from the, from the period that my parents lived in. And obviously there were no first person accounts published or no, um, there was no information from that time. And one can assume that there were gays at that time as there always have been. Um, and so I realized it would, to, uh, I'd, I decided to take it on myself to kind of write the homoerotic history of the Franco era. Um, but the only source material I had was the first person stories from my parents. So I had to then use my parents as protagonists in erotic stories, um, namely my father who became the lead character, who became a closet homosexual, who in fact um, was um, obsessively fanatical about the Franco dictatorship and loved it and sort of subverted in these stories that I wrote um, all of the tropes of this fascist regime that are very much closely linked to gay aesthetics already, uniforms and, you know, this hyper masculinity, masculine imagery. Um, and I wrote um, a kind of first person account from the perspective of my father. What you're looking at is the way the project ended, which is um, a full reconstruction of the bar that I use as a kind of performance venue where I would tell stories um, with a Spanish guitarist. And I would, it was basically reconstructed on the few fragments or images that I had of my parents' um, bar. But preceding that, um, I first, started sending stories to gay magazines, mostly in America that wrote um, these kind of back of magazine sections that are about first person experiences. And um, I realized as I was writing them, this really touched a nerve because there was, um, America was in several wars at, the, at that time and had several soldiers stationed around the world. Um, and, um, and what really struck a chord for the editors of this magazine was this kind of military history mixing with the homoerotic history. Um, and so they encouraged me to write more and more real life stories, which I was writing under my father's name. Um, and um, this became a kind of attempt to write a novel, um, which failed and then turned into a bar. So these are a couple of views of this kind of almost surrealist, hyper-eroticized um, version of my parents' bar. And this project, which was in 2010, um, was in the last year of my um, art education. And I think it mixes a lot of the concerns from um, dealing with the idea, first and foremost, of um, taking real human lives and fictionalizing them, putting them through a kind of process, um, a, a fantasizing process, and seeing what comes out the other end when you deal with something that is political and serious and has really affected people in histories and shape the world. Um, and then putting them through an almost a theme park-esque um, mill in which they turn into kind of um, entertainment. I'll be talking and um, focusing a bit more of that on that later, but I think that kind of maybe sets a bit of the groundwork for how I approached um, the Anne Frank house. Now, I was never interested in Anne Frank growing up. I didn't read the book. I obviously knew who Anne Frank was, very well, as everybody, almost everybody does. Um, um, I visited the Anne Frank house, um, which is here in blue, um, with some students in 2017. And it was not my intention to make a big project about Anne Frank. Um, I visited it because I was interested in um, the notion of a piece of architecture that has become hyper symbolic. This is a video of the queue um, for the Anne Frank house. It's several hours long and people occupy an entire square outside the house um, 
um, which becomes almost kind of like a public demonstration um, of care, of empathy, of interest, or of just um, sheep-like tourism. It could be a combination of all of those things at the same time. Um, but it interested me that this history of this one individual could hold such power and continue to hold such power um, in the modern, in the contemporary world. Um, I got a special guided tour from um, a, a man who had been working and running the bookshop, uh, the gift shop at the Anne Frank Museum. And he explained to me that recently they tried to um, change this queue system to an online ticketing system. Um, and um, there was uproar. Um, people wanted the queue um, and they were happy to wait. In fact, the queue was a visual symbol of people caring about Anne Frank. And by removing that, it would be in some senses following a trend of everything that is digitalized, which is that people disappear and we don't know who is doing what, where, why, or why they care, except as a kind of icon or a series of numbers or likes in the corner of the screen. Um, I wanted to approach the house um, by removing some of the emotional narrative that we are very clearly um, told to, expected to um, consider in thinking about the Anne Frank story. Um, and I wanted to look at what the house itself represented as a kind of cultural or material artifact. Um, one question I asked my students before we went was, what kind of, let's look at things like the practicals, what kind of bathrooms will they have? This house is um, a representation, not of the life of Anne Frank only, but of um, the history of um, a resistance, the history of um, um, anti-discrimination, of unity, of empathy. Of hope. So will they have all gender restrooms or will they continue to have um, um, gender singular bathrooms? How will they be designed? What kind of font will we be seeing in the Anne Frank house? Are they going to be using metal or wood? And what would those materials say about the way that this museum wants to translate the message of the history of this house? Um, it became incredibly interesting as I went through the house um, to see the ways in which um, or to understand through the guide, the ways in which the house had been converted or restored um, from what you see in the black and white images here, which is how the house was left to how the house now appears um, in, of course, in these color images. We can see that there's wallpaper here and there isn't wallpaper in the images that were taken after the Frank family had left or after the house had been repurchased several years after the Frank family left. And I became very interested in this wallpaper and I asked the guide why there was this very authentic looking but very fresh and clean wallpaper um, in the Anne Frank house. And he explained to me that when the um, Anne Frank house was, was bought, um, that um, they wanted to restore it to look like the Anne Frank house for several years, something like 20 years in between since the family was taken, um, taken away and many perished in the Holocaust the house was turned into offices or it was just reverting back to um, um, regular use. And so it needed to look again like the Anne Frank house. And for that restoration process, they um, needed the same wallpaper that the Anne Frank family lived with. And they explained to me that they found that wallpaper or the architects found that wallpaper in, um, in East German um, former communist factories. And that just blew my mind at that point because I was standing in the Anne Frank house, which is the site of resistance to the atrocities of the German state um, and seeing that the whole house was lined in German wallpaper. Um, it also excited me that there was this kind of um, secret history to the house that was told through the um, provenance of its materials. Um, and it also touched me in some ways that um, we as humans will make certain ideological sacrifices, if we can think of that as being an ideological sacrifice, um, in order to present an experience for people in the now. So it's about, in some ways, prioritizing the visitor experience, um, their animal, their physicality, their, their engagement with a place um, for um, using, um, finding the correct material, but it, perhaps not being ethically in line with the message of the house. Or is it? Because it could also be a sign of reconciliation. Um, 
I, um, there were several other points in the house that interested me, but I never really thought of Anne Frank as a, uh, the house as a construct. I just thought it was, um, I followed the image I suppose I had in my mind, which would be a kind of Hollywood image, um, the easiest and um, most seductive version of any story probably, the almost boiled down or simplified version, um, which is that the Anne Frank house was just closed up and like a Petri dish and then it was just opened and now we're experiencing this time capsule rather than a crafted um, thought through um, and in some ways fabricated um, and very considered experience. Um, and I started to research and find many, many versions of the Anne Frank house having been built and rebuilt, as well as the story having been told and retold, um, most famously in the original Anne Frank movie that features Millie Perkins and won an Oscar. Um, by the time I got to the gift shop in the Anne Frank house um, or the museum shop, um, I was very excited, so I started to buy up pretty much everything that they were selling, um, thinking of this as some kind of material evidence um, of the experience that I'd had then. One was this blank diary, which um, is a kind of reference to the original Anne Frank diary with this tartan rim, um, but it's blank on the inside and you can write your own messages inside or your own diary. Um, it horrified me at first because of course, as a total um, millennial narcissist that I am, I was just thinking, what, what am I gonna write in this diary that would ever match up to um, Anne Frank and you know, oh, I spilt my chai latte this morning and my hot yoga was um, really frustrating and blah, blah, blah. You know, these daily occurrences um, that one has and these frustrations can never match the historical gravity. And why should I be allowed to put this in a facsimile of the Anne Frank diary? Um, similarly, um, there was a cardboard model um, in the gift shop, which you can build your, build by yourself in between 20 and 40 minutes, depending on your skill. Um, and um, I bought this and was fascinated by it as a kind of strange IKEA kit part where you could build this very horrifying and, and tragic site um, within your hands and produce a kind of version of this, of what I considered at the time still a very sacred building. Um, why should I have my fingers all over this house and also have the power then to rearrange it? You know, could the secret annex be bigger in which they hid? Does Anne Frank, could she have an extension or a bigger bedroom? And all of these thoughts, which I didn't really want to be thinking about or thought I was even allowed to be thinking about were suddenly placed in my hands. However, I did approach um, all of these topics with um, less kind of cynicism perhaps that I'm speaking about it now, um, which is to say that I thought through the reasons why these objects exist. And in fact, they are um, somewhat, um, they're deeply complex objects that are trapped in several ideologies. And all of those ideologies are ideologies that we cherish at this point, um, assuming that whoever it is out there in this Zoom um, share some sense of humanity and a kind of liberal-ish politics. Um, you'll probably agree with me that we somewhat all agree that democracy is the least bad of all forms of governing. Um, that um, whilst capitalism is disgusting and terrible, we can't, none of us here probably have a better solution right now. So let's at least have some kind of nicer version of capitalism or capitalism that does some good, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And also that, yes, whilst some of us might also be elitist and snobbish, we also maybe believe that um, participation and sharing and, um, and transfer of information are valuable things. And these objects contain all of those good values. They are um, objects that are products that make money for the house, but the house or the museum uh, use that money to make programs that um, expand on um, questions that um, try to educate around discrimination, around racism, around anti-Semitism. Um, they're objects that allow people to participate. And I quickly realized that I'm not the target audience for these objects. It's actually young people. And what is, um, who am I to take away the pleasure of a young girl from India or from America who has read Anne Frank's diary and comes to Amsterdam, finds this blank diary and thinks this is the most wonderful thing 
that they could ever imagine that they could possibly write in a facsimile or to or that the house the model was in fact used originally as an educational tool and was incredibly useful in teaching children through physical engagement how to understand not only the story of Anne Frank but the story of fascism and um, and um, anti-semitism the holocaust and the oppressive Nazi regime so all of those things I think are very valuable and um, and so these objects kind of created this um, rift in me of a kind of embarrassment about myself, my own reaction, embarrassment about what, how these things exist, and but an excitement about the conflicts that they contain. And then they seemed very truthful to me because they contain a kind of conflict that I think resides in many of us today uh, as we try to navigate this very murky, complicated world where we don't know what our actions um, in any sense, whenever we purchase something, for example, what the knock on effect is, if we're doing something good or if we're doing something bad. Um, I'm going to um, just skip to a few images of the exhibition. So I then took the um, Anne Frank house model. I um, took it apart and I thought about it almost like an Ikea module. Um, the way it had been designed was this kind of flat packed uh, house and I thought, um, I would like to blow this model house back up to full size so that people can actually walk through um, an enlarged version of the um, of the kit part of the historical model of the Anne Frank house. And in that I can put objects um, that speak about many of these conflicts and confusions that I had in, sort of started to really engage with in the process of seeing the house, but that don't only uh, relate to Anne Frank. So what you see at the Blaffer Museum is a section of the Anne Frank House blown up to full size, which is representing the secret annex, the rooms in which Anne Frank lived um, and her family. And they contain several objects um, from um, uh, everyday life that somehow um, speak to me of the, uh, rather than the kind of evils of capitalism, but where good intentions raise um, much more complex questions and issues. Um, I'm going to speak about one object only from that before I move on to some other works. Um, the first work I wanted to show um, when I was conceiving this was uh, the outfit that Beyonce wore when she visited the Anne Frank house. Um, you can see her on the right hand side of the screen uh, crouching underneath two images of Anne Frank in a sanctioned area of the Anne Frank house um, where photos are allowed to be taken. Um, <clears throat> Beyonce is known to do everything very properly and very well and she's very media savvy and I respect her for that um, and so looking at the way in which Beyonce visits the Anne Frank house provides some kind of case study in how um, celebrities can, should, um, or do interact with the Anne Frank legacy. Um, this image um, is, um, I'm just using to illustrate the several of the contemporary celebrities that have visited the Anne Frank house to speak about why it has such an attraction to very, very famous people um, today. Um, in some ways, visiting the Anne Frank house and it being a public, is a public statement of one's um, belief in history, one's engagement with the same issues that Anne Frank represents, um, and to show a side of oneself as a celebrity that is somewhat humble, that that um, that you can show that there is that you too believe that there is a history that's bigger than you and more important than you, and it's quite difficult to show humility when you're um, Beyonce, I, I guess. So the Anne Frank House or or Justin Bieber. Or, any one of these celebrities. And the Anne Frank House provides a kind of an option, you could say, for very famous people to um, show solidarity or humility. Um, and it, that's why it was interesting for me to look at how celebrities visit and where it goes right and where it goes wrong. And famously, it went very wrong for Justin Bieber, um, who wrote in the guest book of the Anne Frank House, I, I, hoped, I hope Anne Frank would have been a believer, which is a fan of mine. Um, and was sort of destroyed in the press for that. And Beyonce was praised. And she was praised um, largely because of the sensitivity around how she visited the house, um, the way she photographed herself there, but also for the outfit that she wore, which is a sky blue uniform from the British high street retailer Topshop. 
um, why is Beyonce wearing um, high street clothing when she could e easily be wearing a very high end brand like Chanel? I think Beyonce knows you don't go to the Anne Frank house dressed in Givenchy. She knows that it would signal the wrong message. And so she chose for this specific um, visit, this highly visible visit, um, a low key outfit that was also interestingly a uniform, which is of course about being part of the people um, and um, about erasing one's own identity to some extent. She shows sky blue, which is a, a very apolitical color. Where do you see sky blue? You see it in the sky on a blue day. There's a positivity to it. Um, and um, I chose to show this outfit because um, I discovered that after her first Instagram post, um, the outfit was sold out internationally online. Um, and I discovered that because I, I wanted to show this outfit and it was not possible to buy it. So um, I had to have it physically handmade to the dimensions of Beyonce, having sourced the material um, from the factory in Italy. Um, another work in the exhibition is a wax figure of Anne Frank. I'm just taking the time because I'm talking in far too much detail about everything. Um, this is um, a work called Likeness. And in my entire time researching Anne Frank, I never thought that I would ever um, deal with the body of Anne Frank because she was a girl that died in the Holocaust. She's a female. Um, and I felt that it would be crossing a boundary to deal with the physical form of Anne rather than the image or the architecture, which had already been put out so much into public space and had already in many ways been um, consumed. Um, and so I stayed away from working with the body of Anne Frank. Um, I'll come back to that until I went to Madame Tussauds in Berlin. Um, you don't see Ma you don't see Anne Frank in this image because she is, as it says in the label here, Anne Frank has been um, is not on display display for several days because she's having some upkeep done, which is to say her hair and her makeup was being um, um, refreshed. Um, this is an image of the Anne Frank figure at the Madame Tussauds in Berlin. And it was a very frightening and very um, shocking and disturbing experience to see Anne Frank for the first time in three dimensions and in color, um, just a few hundred meters away from the Brandenburg gates and the historic um, place in Bunker of Hitler um, on this large boulevard in Berlin. And seeing her now as part of a kind of entertainment complex um, this, what I considered at the time, a very trashy, poppy um, venue, Madame Tussauds, which sort of just skates very lightly over all kinds of histories and turns them into photo props. Um, should Anne Frank become a photo prop um, in that setting? And should she become fodder for this tourist porn um, that in Berlin that just celebrates the horrors of the Second World War as a kind of um, fun, scary um, attraction for the city. Um, I spent the day looking at Anne Frank um, and how people interact with her. And the first thing that I noticed was that I'd never seen um, Anne Frank sitting in that exact position that she is at Madame Tussauds. So um, this was the closest image of Anne Frank that I found in my research, but it, she's uh, somewhat younger in this. And in this image, she looks like she's almost around 14, which is the age that she died. Um, I then realized that Anne Frank had been designed, um, which just blew my mind as just as a sentence to think about designing Anne Frank and um, what that process is to design a figure for Madame Tussauds, um, which you can see on the left here, has this very, um, very uncomfortable, almost eugenicist, um, kind of apparatus, cranial measurements, teeth replacements, hair color, eye colors, all of this kind of thing to design um, a version of Anne Frank in color, which would have been um, a fabrication because we do not have color images of Anne Frank. So how does one decide what skin tone Anne Frank should have? Um, and what are, what are the processes that go into that? Um, we think of Anne Frank as quite light skinned somehow, but is that just because Hollywood has used so many young white girls 
to represent Anne Frank. Um, and obviously for the purposes of selling a movie, a young white girl, as we have learned very well, is going to sell more than another ethnicity, for example. Um, I had to go through that entire process myself when designing my version of Anne Frank, which is, again, troubling and um, um, uncomfortable. Um, but the main reason I wanted to do this was to expose a kind of um, almost a, an injustice that I had um, seen around the way in which Anne Frank was being um, used and presented at the Madame Tussauds Museum. Further note on the design of Anne Frank at Madame Tussauds is why is she looking in this particular angle? Why is her head at this angle and why, her, why are her eyes in this um, position? And I realized over the course of the day, as families would come, and this is not my conjecture, but this is unfortunately the way that it generally happens is that the father who is the tourist with the big camera would take a photo of the wife and the child standing next to Anne Frank. And as I looked online through Instagram images of this wax sculpture, I realized Anne was always engaging with the photos that were taken of her perfectly looking into the camera. And I realized that her head position and her eyes had been designed to maximally engage with the height of an average white man holding a camera. Um, so um, this um, turned into a work that is called Likeness in which I used a robotic camera, um, which is a kind of rather inhuman, um, um, way of shooting things. It was actually developed for the advertising industry to film things like what you're seeing on the left, which is these kind of amazing images we now have in adverts of that, that tomato, ultimate tomato flying through space, being sliced, the juice coming out and seeing that in 3D as well, or in, in you know, from all angles. And that is something this robotic camera can do. Um, and it makes objects feel um, incredibly uh, alive and, and um, existential almost. Um, and I paired that with a wax creation of Anne Frank that I designed um, and presented also at the Blaffer Museum um, where the camera is scanning um, the figure of Anne Frank almost algorithmically because the camera does not know what it's looking at. Um, and it kind of creates this um, sense of, um, of Anne Frank being almost at times, almost like an animation, with, just because of the way the camera moves, um, but also of, of, of a of, of great proximity to the figure of Anne allowed through this technology. However, the way I present it is with um, a barrier and a seven meter distance so that you cannot physically approach the body of Anne Frank. Um, which means that um, to go back to the kind of question that I had at the beginning about how does one deal with um, a, a, the body of Anne Frank, the way I dealt with it was to not allow people to go close to it and to keep it in the realm of the image. Um, and the reason I chose seven meters for her to be distanced from the viewer is because you cannot quite look around her at this point. So, so Anne always remains almost as a, as a, as a flat. Um, even though you know that she's three-dimensional and then this camera brings you into um, the kind of, a kind of intimate realm but of course we know it's not intimate because it's an outsourced eye and not your own. Um, I'm going to make a really brief segue um, that's not as much about my work but about the kind of research that emerged from this. Um, as I delve more into Madame Tussauds, because I worked with former staff um, members from Madame Tussauds to produce this Anne Frank figure. And I had always thought of um, Madame Tussauds, as I said, as this kind of um, mega exhibition that's kind of this very um, capitalist, fa family friendly and empty experience. Um, but what I didn't know was that it um, has um, very long and deep political ties to the history of um, recreation of humans, of bodies, um, but also of democracy, um, entertainment. In fact, most of the bastions of the media world that we are living with today. Sorry. <clears throat> um, so who was Madame Tussauds? That was my first question. Madame Tussauds on the left here 
at the age of 24 in 1784 was a resident of Versailles and worked for Marie Antoinette, the Queen of France, the last queen um, that was um, beheaded um, during the French Revolution. Um, Marie Tussauds um, was the daughter of a wax maker and she was hired by the Palace of Versailles to make wax flowers for the Queen. Um, when the um, revolution came, um, of course, Marie Tussauds was not in a great position because she had been hanging out with the enemy and hanging out in Versailles. So the uh, revolutionary said, your head has to go as well, um, Mary Tussauds. And what she had up her sleeve was the ability to make hyper-realistic um, three-dimensional wax images of humans. And she negotiated with the revolutionaries and said, if you save me, I will make wax recreations of all of the aristocracy and royalty that you are killing so that we have a record of these people. And so she was allowed, she was allowed to um, live and she spent some years going to um, execution sites um, and bribing the executioner to get fast cast um, uh, wax um, uh, face masks, face um, death masks of um, all of the French nobility and aristocracy, um, which she was then able to used to make sometimes full body representations of them. Um, that included her former boss, Mary Antoinette. Um, rather gruesomely, I think, um, she was able to get the death mask of Mary Antoinette. And all of those, um, uh, these, these are some actual Madame Tussauds wax renderings of Madame Tussauds <laughs> casting the first heads. Um, and then um, Marie Tussauds left um, to London and got an apartment on Baker Street and opened the doors, showing all of the heads of the French aristocracy that had been killed. And this became an attraction in London because we are living, they were living at a time that was before photography. Um, and of course, painting and imaging images were um, in elite institutions. But the general public, of course, wanted to see famous people that they heard about. Um, they heard about the French Revolution. And so to be able to go to a, a place, and this is during the Enlightenment, so it's also a period when we have humans suddenly realizing that they're individuals, and on a Sunday afternoon, maybe wanting to do something fun and entertaining um, and not just go to church. So um, they would then go to attractions, um, and Madame Tussauds was one of them. Um, and this is the origins of the, um, the kind of franchise which has become international, which I thought was interesting largely because, um, well, for two reasons. One, in the sense of um, it represents this longing for hyper real imagery of connection through pictures to, um, to famous people, to icons. It represents the boiling down of um, real lives into objects and images, which we know very well now because we just, we do this to ourselves um, through Instagram every day. I call it an auto iconization, the process of turning oneself into an icon. Um, and this kind of represents like a very early form of that. And I think of it almost as like a pre, a pre photography or a pre-celebrity magazine, something like this. Um, and of course it contains um, the best and the worst of life, which is these things that we aspire to, wealth, beauty, power, um, and then also violence and death and sadness. And they are all represented in these, in these heads and that being kind of the origins of this, of this um, multi-million dollar franchise um, was kind of uh, very um, enlightening to me. This is a total segue, but I'm going to just talk about um, a series of works, just maybe so you understand how some of this thinking translates into um, um, other kinds of works that I make. This is a series called Fabulous Beasts, and they are um, fur coats that I purchase, secondhand fur coats that are very readily available in Berlin, but not very w much wanted because, of course, ethically, it's not um, super good these days to be wearing fur. Um, and so there are piles and piles of fur coats sold very cheaply 
um, things that were once very luxurious items. Um, and um, I started shave, buying these fur coats and, and thinking, what can we do with this very precious material that was grown on an animal and was brutally ripped off them and now lay in warehouses or on flea markets? Is there a way to redeem this? Um, so I started to shave the fur off, which is perhaps the most beautiful part of it, um, to kind of de-surface de it and then to rethink about another kind of surface that it contained. And as I did that, I found that there were these amazing um, patchwork worlds underneath something like a leopard um, or an ocelot, which is the image you're seeing on the left here. The ocelot is, of course, not big enough to cover a human body. So you need several small ocelots, which is what you realize when you see that there are many little pieces sewn together. Um, in many of them, there's handwriting, there's um, information, instructions of assembly, but also signatures of the people who were sewing and producing them. And um, I was able to chronicle in some ways through, I've made several of these um, from different decades um, and mostly German. Um, I was able to chronicle through the quality of the skin, the, um, the political conditions of the country at the time of its production. So for example, um, just after the Second World War, the, once you remove the fur, you see that the skin is very pockmarked and, and has a lot of holes and a lot of fixings. And I spoke to a furrier who explained to me that like humans after the Second World War, animals also suffered very um, bad living conditions and no medication and all of this kind of thing. So their skin got very bad. Um, and, that, um, and that these furs were from animals that were living through the hardships of post Second World War Germany, even if they were only being raised to be killed, that you can detect it in the skin. So they also became kind of um, it, literal archaeology as I removed the fur um, and an and, and actual sort of archaeology as they revealed kind of things about the societies and the times that they lived in, but always through this very glossy and quite glamorous exterior. Um, speaking of which is my former art teacher at high school, Joanne. Um, these are images that I had taken of her with a a leading British fashion photographer. Um, let me see what time it is. Oh, I should stop, shouldn't I? We should, we're finishing in 10 minutes, aren't we? I'd say, Simon, uh, let's, let's speak about this, this project and then maybe we can wrap up. Well, maybe I'll actually just present you my latest project. Or shall I speak about this one? What would you like? Just speak a little bit about Joanne, I think. Okay, Joanne was my former high school teacher. She taught me art in um, a very um, elite um, British boarding school. You're seeing the um, images of the installation, the video installation that I produced with her. Um, Joanne, in the image on the right, you see her winning the Miss Northern Ireland beauty pageant. Um, and on the left, you see um, some newspaper, tabloid newspapers, where it was just, it was, printed in public newspapers images of her topless um, images that were taken privately and then um, distributed by we don't know who um, and circulated and that then destroyed her career at school um, and within this kind of very um, Puritan British sort of press um, destroyed what became this kind of mega story of the beauty queen at this very elite school that kind of was going around ruining the reputations of these upstanding young men. We met, I was a scholarship student at this school. They take every year they do a kind of fairy tale, um, fairy tale, what would you even call it? Um, process where they take one poor um, ethnic minority from the local kind of trashy local town, which is where I was living, and um, give them a free education at this very, very um, fancy Harry Potter-like um, school. Um, and Joanne and I met there and um, um, spoke a lot about, she kind of introduced me to um, feminist art, to um, a lot of the concerns I actually work with now, which is about the surface, about skin, about the superficial parts of society that can actually reveal um, very um, profound um, um, profound consequences on us emotionally and and for our histories. 
Um, and after this um, newspaper article that came out and kind of ruined her, it was ongoing for, and has been ongoing for several years. Um, I contacted Joanne again and said, would you like to make a film together that was a kind of rebranding project where we um, worked with some of the top technologies of our times and all of the kind of new media networks which were not available to her when the scandal happened um, to look at what it takes to redeem one's image using um, the tools that we have today and so we met with focus groups um, and filmed this and we met with stylists we borrowed clothes we completely reinvented her social media um, and took on a kind of um, uh, turn in, in many ways used her life material to create a kind of character um, which would explore the violence somehow of the machine that one has to interact with to um, to when one has already kind of been thrust into an, a total image world or judged completely on an image which is um, the kind of root of Jan's problem which is that she um, um, has no power to remove those topless images from the internet so um, she, because she doesn't own them which is a, a very kind of sick and weird consequence of, of the way data is protected um, so that um, that's a kind of run through of certain work that might support a little bit around the exhibition um, and I'm happy to talk for three more minutes about a new work but we only have six minutes so maybe if there's a question we should do that instead what do you think, Stephen? I think I think you should talk a little bit about the Istanbul project, so I mean, and then we'll oh, then we can we can run a little bit uh, over. I will I will go to um I will go to my new work, I think. Um, so, um, the new work is not in my PowerPoint, is it? Oh yes, it is. Um, the new work is um a work that is called. Who the bear? I've invented a cartoon character called Who. Um, it's a bear and it's a cartoon character that has um, no identity, no race, no gender, no ethnicity and um, no clear sexuality. Um, they, um, what they do have on their side is that they are an image that they are a picture, a cartoon and a design, which means that whilst they don't know who they are and they're constantly seeking a kind of affirmation by looking at other images, um, they can become any image they want because they already are an image. Um, the project is executed through um, several hundred drawings and um, two of which that you see here um, and um, a series of animations and um, sculptures, which are all, um, handmade in a very rough. That is to say that um, I, the Who the Bear is a kind of um, universe, it's a kind of fairy tale um, that sort of incorporates all of the interests that I've been working on over the years into one entire character and um, but a character that is completely handmade and hand-drawn um, and was very much something that came out of the pandemic experience of, um, as you've seen with many of my other works that produced, I have to collaborate with a lot of people, I have to travel a lot and was very much a reaction to um, these apocalyptic thoughts of not being ever able to make anything again in that way and how to, how to continue to speak and, um, and explore the subjects that I'm working with um, in a very direct manner. So that is uh, the next project I'm working on. Thank you, thank you so much, Simon. Uh, wonderful overview and, and sort of interconnections uh, with Hope House. Uh, I wanna now open it up to the audience. Thank you so much for, for staying with us and um, would love to invite any questions that you might have for Simon. I have a question and um, that would be what, if any, critical um, response have you had to your exhibit? Not constructive criticism, but criticism, criticism. To the Hope House exhibit? 
Yes. Um, if I think um, mostly before I made the project the first time, because I showed the work in, in Israel first um, with my gallery, Devere Gallery, um, who really encouraged me to make the work. And I was, I was um, confused about making a work about Anne Frank because I'm not Jewish and I'm not, uh, I don't, there's very little that connects me superficially um, mm -hmm. or under the current ideas of, of who and how we should work with material um, would seem that it's not material that's for me to work with. Um, but I thought that the things I discovered and understood and the way I wanted to speak about it were really valuable and were things that I wanted to communicate. Um, and I think some of the, the less constructive criticisms were from colleagues um, before I made the project that were scared on my behalf of, mm -hmm. of making this exhibition because of the media landscape we live in and the idea that an Instagram post or someone who's angry on Facebook about um, what my identity represents and how I'm presenting the uh, presenting Anne Frank in a quite methodical way um, that would be um, problematic, especially in Israel. Mm -hmm. And um, and I found it very interesting. I mean, there were mostly there were kind of the intelligentsia and intelligent people who were sort of saying, you know, this is really interesting, this is great stuff, but it's just, we're just, it's just not the right time to do it. And there's a lot of stupid people out there. There was a lot of that, you know, them saying, there's, there's really stupid people who will just not get this. And I always operate under the idea that um, people are not stupid, that if you give mm -hmm. them something really um, thought through, well, um, um, really, um, earnestly um, produced because there is no cynicism in that project and there's no kind of secret desire for personal gain happening in that work. Um, um, that if you give them something that is sin really sincere and really worked, um, then people will get that on some level. And also the aesthetics really matter. If you present it very um, clearly, and make the argument very well. And that's what my job was, you know, mm -hmm. to convince people um, that this isn't some, um, some strange provocation. Um, and I think you just know that when you walk into the exhibition, only I, I, but I, only I knew that at that time because I'm the only one that had envisioned what it was going to be. And for mm -hmm. others, it was just a, um, a set of words of like, you know, I'm rebuilding the Anne Frank house, which is like Ugh. in Israel. Ugh. You know? <laughs> um, and, um, and so that was very unconstructive because it sort of sowed fear in me. Um, but, I, but I was left with, um, a very clear question uh, as an artist, which is um, what do you believe in more? Which is mm -hmm. um, what I'm doing and uh, the value of it um, and the sincerity of it. And what, am I willing to compromise that for possibility that um, some people don't even know, know what I'm trying to do um, would scupper that. And mm -hmm. so I went ahead with it and it sharpened me. It definitely sharpened kind of the, my approach and made me aware of that. Um, and you know the the kind of nice ending to this story I suppose you could say is the first people that walked into the exhibition were an, an elderly couple and I just was eavesdropping and the guy was walking around in, in Tel Aviv saying what is this little European house doing here and the wife was like, oh, it's, it's the Anne Frank house. And he's like, where was that? In like Belgium or something? And she's like, no, it's in Amsterdam. And, and I was like, you know, we are in the Middle East now. We're not in, mm. you know, and, and it alerted to me, me to the idea that what my colleagues in Europe were flagging was a kind of deeply rooted European white Protestant guilt mm. about the war. And, and projecting pain and fear onto um, a nation of modern living people, you know, in Israel that don't go around all day treasuring Anne Frank and worrying about, you know, th their lives are not entirely consumed by the Holocaust. They're, they're living in now as well. Yeah. Um, and that they were really um, focusing on an image of 
a nation and reducing it to a series a, a group of victims mm. um, and um, and I realized in that moment and in several other encounters in 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 Israel that were largely excited about it because there's something of course audacious about presenting that as well um, that signaled a kind of freedom to speak about this in a new way that wasn't necessarily and a lot of Israeli artists said to me that it would be very hard to make this work as an Israeli or as, as a Jewish person um, mm -hmm. because of because of the politics of how implicated they would be in it and how close they are to it so um, I do I deeply believe in um, um, you know challenging people on what their intentions and on thinking really hard and um, questioning how and why people work with material that is not theirs, um, if we can reduce it to that idea. Um, but I don't think there's, um, there are rules that can um, truly stop someone working with something if they really have something to say. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be a kind of, uh, and, uh, yeah, you said unconstructive criticism, but obviously it was quite constructive ultimately. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Mary Lee, for your question. Um, uh, we have a couple of questions in the chat box, but I wanted to ask um, Professor Natalie Haran. Would Natalie, would you like to read the question or would you like me to relay it? Oh, sure. I'd love to ask it, actually. Okay. Thank you so much for the fantastic talk and the fantastic work. Um, I think this actually kind of relates to the, the prior question but thinking more broadly about your engagement with uh, mediums, you spoke about how the work is really about image culture and how it affects us and how we're always thinking about how we are imaged. And yet the work is very material. It's very three-dimensional, it's very concrete. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what your commitment to working three-dimensionally enables us to think about these image worlds that we are now sort of subsumed. In, under um i haven't thought about it very much but i think if i do think about it now and it's which is what is an interesting question i think um i am to go back to the kind of question of working with images i think i i think i'm totally traumatized by um the fact that i don't know very well that i think i've been completely colonized by image culture from an early age. And that has partly to do with my um, upbringing. And, you know, I grew up in a tiny fishing village in England, mostly before the internet. I was the only one there who wasn't white. Um, I was the only gay person that I knew. <laughs> um, and so I would live for the monthly magazine, like ID magazine or whatever, the face or stuff from London and, you know, or MTV or, you know, I completely lived through media because there was just nothing around me that I thought I could relate to. Um, and so I think I'm very like, um, I grew up obsessing over images and believing in them as realities. And as an adult, I know that that's not the truth. Um, and, um, and being of a generation where I've gone from analog to digital, I'm 38. So um, seeing the transition and then seeing all of these young people who I just see as like, they're just like little me's, you know, but they, they're not growing up in a tiny fishing village. They are in really exciting cities, like they're in Berlin. Why, you know, they don't need to live through images as much as I did. Um, so, um, so I guess I put those as um, posts, goalposts between this conversation to think about, um, why it is then I am so obsessed with creating experience in the work because, um, because I, I think that there's only so much image has served me, you know, in my, in my life. I realized at some point that it's not going to truly serve me um, and that images will always be images and um, they've disappointed me. And so I think a lot of my work is about taking those pictures and turning them into things that don't disappoint people when they come into an exhibition, that they provide so much more because I think I've been learning through my life that I'm not um, an image either and that I'm an animal and that um, I've sort of like, in an almost science fiction way gone like, oh wow, my eyes can register three dimensional things and 
I have a body and, you know, I have consequences, I have, politi- I have politics, I have all these things. Those are the things I've learned um, and, and never assumed as kind of like inbuilt or never taught to me. And so um, I think um, in, in three-dimensionalizing, creating these, these worlds that you encounter physically, I want to first see for myself that I can be in the world. You know, first make things first. Um, I, it's definitely secondary to that, you know, that it's experienced, but it's first learning for myself what, um, if I'm proving to myself that I can go beyond being an image. <laughs> Um, and then thinking very hard about how other people can then, I think the installations are a weird mixture of an image and three dimensionality because everything you're looking at is a reference to something, you know, and it's, you know, I, some of the works I didn't show you that were these kind of miniatures, but they're all, everything is a reference. Everything is taken from an image and turned into three dimensions. And so there's always a game with that, especially in the Anne Frank piece, which is very much about negotiating what you're allowed to see and what you're not and where your body is and and all of that but that's um i think that's the best answer i can give at the moment thank you so much um i'm gonna i'm gonna relay simon the next question um, from artist emily duval uh, <laughs> so she asks in your work you seem to always have a distance while while you put your subjects in a position of exposure historically or socially speaking could you, could you develop more about that? Could you say that it is the inner exhibitionism that resides in all of us? Mm, I think that um, I, in some, in some of the works, like the Anne Frank work or in the Joanne, there's a feeling of me being removed from it. And um, that's a question I negotiate a lot because um, I think about what it is that um, a viewer is going to, um, what is the most generous thing for a viewer and is the most generous thing to feel safe because I am the artist at the center of the narrative. And you know where I'm going to stand on things, which is like, you know, left-leaning, liberal, you know, it's just so obvious, I'm an artist. Um, So, um, and that doesn't feel, um, threatening in a positive way, which is to say, um, I do have ideas that are um, uh, worrying and worry me and I allow them to come out and I allow myself to engage with advertising companies and, you know, um, ugly, ugly tunnels of capitalism and um, image culture. And um, I think if I put my, I often think if I put myself too much in the forefront of it, then you will see me as some kind of hero or anti-hero in that. And I think it's better that you, um, if one had to choose, that you would come away from a work thinking, well, that artist is a total fucking asshole, but the people in the um, work are um, X, Y, or Z, or amazing, or interesting, or whatever. Because I don't think the value of um, seeing a work like Hope House is to come out going like, how clever and good is that artist? Because that's not what I think about myself. So um, I think there is a, a, um, a clear and calculated distancing, and that's a choice that I, I have to make, which is to serve the, serve the work ultimately. Hmm. But on another level, I've also been um, wondering about the idea of um, resisting a kind of um, hyper-connectivity to the work that presents itself as expression um, too closely um, because of the way in which um, creativity, the way in which artists and ways in which expression has become co-opted by capitalism as another box ticking feature of, you know, something that can be sold and repurposed. And so, I try to resist falling into, um, uh, I don't suppose I try to resist it. I just never feel comfortable if I think of myself as a product to be consumed. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm, and that's why I think I keep changing what I work with and how I work and all the different forms and medias. It's sort of every work you see, if you know me and you know my work deeply, you will know it's my, who it is and the brain that it's coming from but the forms are so radically different that you can think it's several different artists and um, I don't mind that. 
Hmm. I think I kind of dodged that question. <laughs> well, it's interesting uh, because I, my question, Simon, was going to be more of, like I think we think about the languages of research-based practice and post-conceptualism that you're not supposed to include personal reference and pop culture. Like those mm -hmm. things almost seem antithetical when we're thinking about mm -hmm. what those, those elements typically represent. Mm -hmm. And yet I think right from the beginning of your presentation, you were sort of, you were referencing your family and their, their hotel in mm -hmm. Spain. And yet you also created a historical fiction based around that. You know, and then you include a video of yourself performing as Captain Von Trapp, you know, in, in the Hope House. And yet there's also kind of a distancing. So I was, I was curious about that, that relationship between the personal and the, the post-conceptual. I think that, um, I mean, I spent like in, in the beginning of my career, I spent more time worrying about that and thinking like, what does it mean? And, um, now I just don't care because when I when I when the, the most um, economical way of saying something is because I found a family video of myself, it will just be in the exhibition because it communicates that. And when it communicates it better that um, it's my high school teacher or it's a cartoon bear, then that's what it is. So <clears throat> I think it all comes down to um, constantly trying to create freedom for myself. And that is to. Um, um, be able to use many languages because of how many languages I've been exposed to, you know, and how many languages we're exposed to on a daily basis. Just walking down the street today, you know, it's like if you think of someone 200 years ago walking down the street and someone walking down the street today, that range of diversity of, you know, materials, technology, of ethnicities, of types of people is of clothing, of fabric, of just the, the, the stuff that we're surrounded by, and then just opening a smartphone and seeing another 150 stories from around the world and textures and people. And it's just incredibly uh, rich and overwhelming. And I want to definitely um, be honest to the experience I have of, you know, how wildly textured life is for me and for us today. So um, I've never been the kind of, artist that sort of sticks to a format or, or, or a kind of material. So, um, and I've just sort of stopped ever thinking about it as conceptual or, or having any kind of meaning beyond um, it just being stuff that I produced during my lifetime. And actually, you know, it's just not my job to interpret it. There's, there's many people whose jobs like you, Stephen, um, who, have livelihoods and lifetime careers um, thinking about this stuff for me. So, um, and I've got hopefully another like 60 years left and then it will be the job if it's worth it of someone to figure out what it all means. But um, I certainly don't want to, to think about that too much myself. Thank you so much. Um, I, wanna, I wanna relay my <clears throat> question from uh, one of our docents, Rona, who I know has been, has toured groups through the show. Um, Rona, do you want to ask the, the question? Or? Sure. Um, so there was a comment first. I did the, uh, I guess it was our, one of our first virtual tours with my Hadassah group with a PowerPoint. And I got um, uh, pretty much, almost everybody was pretty positive, which is, goes to what you were talking about with Israel. They understood. What you, or from as much as I could give them what I thought you were doing. And now I even know more for the next one I do. Um, and I was looking to see those kind of responses among Jewish groups, actually. That was one of the reasons I, I really had wanted to take people in, you know, to this exhibit. Um, the only one person who actually addressed what you did was um, that she didn't feel the emotional response that she thought you should feel, but she, but um, because she had been to the actual Anne Frank house. And you kind of explained that today. And it was kind of the way I explained it was that it wasn't actually a recreation of the experience of visiting. It was something else. Um, but there was one object that you hadn't explained much to us. Um, and it was the mannequin, the uniform. And I had some ideas about what I, why I thought it was in there. The, um, 
but I wondered if you'd address that a little bit. Okay, um, it's a, for those who don't know, it's a um, mannequin that is, a male mannequin that is painted with the Lufthansa Airlines uniform. Oh, that's the uniform, and, okay. Yeah, <laughs> and um, it, it's a reference to um, a gay pride event in Berlin, which as most gay prides have been around the world now have been co-opted by companies since being gay is like really cool now um, and makes money. Um, so they, um, Lufthansa, the, the airline, um, hired a body painter to paint a group of topless men with their uniforms on and they were walking around um, uh, the streets doing gay pride and um, um, I found the same body painter who happens to be Germany's top body painting champion from eight years ago, I think. Um, and she recreated the, out, the, um, the body paint on that. And I just thought, you know, it's a uniformed, muscular, white man walking through the streets of Berlin, you know, which is like, if you think historically about, you know, Germany is very sensitive to fascism obviously and images around fascism so you know just the idea of these um happy gay literally gay policemen looking flight attendants walking around by a massive corporation co-opting a social idea which is this gay pride again kind of had this conflict for me so i wanted to include that in the exhibition thank you um i did not i actually didn't recognize the uniform so that would that would help. I, I, I had an idea about it being um, a representation of a gay image against the a Nazis perfection, the image of what Nazi perfection was. Yeah, I mean, there are, I mean, it's pretty like the like several parts of the gay community and the way it's represented online is quite fascist, you know. It's, it's so, it's so much about hyper masculinity and aestheticizing you know very surface things and of course it's played with that and that's been a way a subverting tool for gay culture to co-opt that you know and you think of the drawings of tom of finland who do that brilliantly um but now it's sort of also become a, a reality where these huge conglomerates are also co-opting it and and using that image and that is where it starts to get a bit uncomfortable um but I also on a on another level that just putting a guarded or a uniformed man in that space has some kind of friction as well. And then when you think, well, no, it's actually about promoting like diversity. That's what this company is doing. So you kind of get gridlocked. It's like, oh no, but it's really good that companies now do put gay people in their adverts and you know, what a mess. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I wanted to, we're, we're coming up on, on our time limit. So I just wanted to see if there is one more question um, in the audience that we can, we can end on. Hmm. No, perhaps not. So. Um, um, I want to thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Simon. Thank you once again for such a rich and, and, and all-encompassing all presentation. We so appreciate it. Um, just want to, again, encourage everyone who has not seen the show yet to, to come and visit us. Uh, we'll just be closed briefly over the Christmas break from December 24th to January 2nd, um, but otherwise open Wednesdays to Sunday. And again, stay tuned for more information around the panel discussions that Simon will be having with um, Alexandra Zapruder and a curator from the Holocaust Museum. So uh, thank you all again for attending and uh, please come and see the show. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>